next speaker is uh, a professor at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, uh, Christine Pettersson. Uh, she works on robotic snakes. And if you're not curious or terrified enough, she takes robotic snakes out of land and puts them in water, which is amazing. Her talk is entitled Bio-Inspiration Gives Snake Robots Moving on Land and Exploring the Oceans. Welcome, Professor. Thank you so much. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. I will present our research on snake robots, which is inspired by biology. In particular, our research is motivated by the mobility demonstrated by biological snakes. Mobility is an important feature for autonomous robots and snakes. They can move in virtually any terrain, including rough terrain, where, for instance, wheeled or legged robots could run into problems. We here see how a biological snake moves in quite cluttered terrain. And instead of avoiding obstacles, it uses the obstacles, pushing against them to move even faster forward. Snakes, they are also very good climbers. And also here we see that the snake uses irregularities in its environment to push itself forward. So it does not try to avoid obstacles, but it utilizes them. Snakes are also excellent swimmers, and due to their slender and flexible body, they can access narrow openings. And some snakes, they can even fly. They climb onto branches and jump off, curling their body to glide through the air. It was falling with grace. Yes, that was falling with grace, yes. <laughs> The first snake robot was, we developed was Anaconda. Uh, this was built as a proof of concept of a robotic fire hose. And the question that was asked was, why should the firefighters need to drag the fire hose into the burning building? Why cannot the fire hose climb in by itself in advance, carrying cameras and other sensors, providing information to the firefighters outside, such that they can plan and execute a safer and more efficient firefighting operation? Anaconda was three meters long, it weighed 75 kilograms and had 20 joints, and it was the first water hydraulic snake robot in the world. And it demonstrated that the concept was indeed realizable, but it also demonstrated that there were a lot of research challenges to overcome when it came to controlling the robot, making it move forward and making it follow a desired path. To look deeper into these research questions, we developed ICO with electric motors, making it much lighter and easier to work with. And we here say, see how it curls up against the obstacles, just as the biological snakes. And it uses the obstacles, pushing against them to move forward. For a robot to be autonomous, it needs to be able to sense its surrounding environment. And Kulko here, which was the next snake robot we developed, it is equipped with contact force sensors behind the blue spares. And Kulko can thus detect obstacles and actively push against them in an efficient manner to move forward. Wiko here, on the other hand, it does not need obstacles to push itself forward. It is equipped with passive wheels, so not motorized wheels, but passive wheels for the sole purpose of creating a, an isotropic friction property. And the reason why the robot needs this friction property, we will get back to later. But we here can notice how undulations make me, we go move forward. We have already seen that one reason why snake robots are so interesting is their mobility. This can, for instance, be useful for space exploration and a feasibility study for the European Space Agency studied how the snake robot can be a helper for the rover, going into cluttered terrain and narrow openings where the rover is not able to go. And this is of particular interest in order to be able to go into caves because what's inside these caves has been protected from radiation. So there is more information in there that then can be found outside of the caves. So mobility is one reason why snake robots are so interesting. The other reason is that the snake robot is a hyper-redundant robot manipulator arm. 
which can also transport itself. So you can equip it with a gripper or another tool in one or in both ends, and it can perform manipulation tasks. So space is one possible habitat for our snake robots. Me personally, I'm equally fascinated by the oceans. Uh, the oceans are tremendously important to us. They contain food sources like fish and seaweed. They contain minerals that we need and a biodiversity that is crucial to maintain and which may, for instance, hold new cures to diseases. The oceans, they are also an important part of the Earth's total ecosystem and can provide us with important information about the state of the Earth, including climate changes. So the oceans play a key role in addressing our global challenges, stemming from an increasing population and the corresponding need for energy, food and minerals, and for addressing the challenge of global warming. And yet, despite being so crucially important to us, we know more about the surface of the moon than we know about the bottom of our own oceans. Only about 5% of the oceans have been explored. And we need to be able to get down there and explore to get more knowledge about what is happening and to utilize its vast resources in a sustainable manner, protecting biodiversity. So how do we get to the bottom of our oceans? Uh, although diving can be wonderful in itself, it can also be dangerous and it is limited how deep divers can go. We have three types of marine robots today. We have survey AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, that is, which are made for traveling long distances. They are torpedo shaped, as you can see here, to achieve good hydrodynamic properties, making them energy efficient. But as you can see, they do not have any manipulator arms, so they cannot interact with their environment. Picking up a sample from the ocean floor, for instance, if we want to interact with the environment, we use ROVs, remotely operated vehicles. These are vehicles equipped with manipulator arms and the box-shaped carrying vehicle, it's not as hydrodynamically efficient as the survey AUV, to say the least. So the ROV is better suited for short range operations. In addition, the big box restricts access, and such an ROV is not able to access narrow spaces, like, for instance, between rocks and inside ice caves. To gain such access, the ROVs, they have been made smaller and smaller, but as they are made smaller and smaller, the arms that they can carry with them also have to be made smaller and smaller. And in the end, we are left with a pure observation ROV, which may look something like this. So, this robot gives access to narrow spaces, but it has no intervention capabilities, no manipulator arms. So with the current marine robots, we need to choose between a robot that can travel long distances, a robot that can interact with this environment, or a robot which can get, gain access to narrow spaces. Since our goal is accessing and exploring the oceans, it can be smart to instead learn from nature. And we here see how sea snakes move efficiently through the water. Their body is long and slender, even more so than the survey AUV. And in addition, it's flexible, able to move efficiently through the water and in between rocks and corals. And inspired by this, inspired by nature, my research group has made robotic snakes that mimic these biological snakes. We here see the snake robot, which we named Mamba, moving around in water. It performs these simple undulations, just like the sea snakes, and we see how efficiently it then moves through the water. Mamba is a demonstrator, a proof of concept, showing that swimming snake robots can indeed traverse the oceans. But to fully understand snake robots, we do what we always do when we want to fully understand a physical system in depth, we build a mathematical model of it. And as many of you are well aware, when we build and develop such a mathematical model, we use pencil and paper and we write page after page after page until we finally understand how the snake robot is behaving. And some people ask, why do we need a mathematical model when we have a physical snake robot like Mamba? And that is because Mamba is one particular snake robot and everything we, we can observe from its behavior, the only thing we know for sure is that this holds for the Mamba robot. 
Well, this mathematical model here, it describes all the snake robots in the world, regardless of whether they are small or large, short or long, swimming or moving on land. So we use mathematics as a language to understand snake robots. And by analyzing this mathematical model here, we can find inherent properties and structures in the snake robots and also in biological snakes. And in this way, we use mathematics to decode the secrets of nature. And the first research question we had, the first thing we wanted to understand was, how do we make the snake robot move forward? We here see anaconda again, and it moves using the same undulations that biological snakes use. But as you can see, it does not move forward. Using our mathematical model analyzing this, we find that the reason for this is its smooth surface. In order for undulations to make the snake robot move forward, the robot needs to have a certain friction property. It must be anisotropic. And specifically, the friction in the sideways direction needs to be larger than the friction in the lengthwise direction. Biological snakes, they have this friction property due to their scaled skin. And in water, the hydrodynamic drag forces provide this property also without these kind of scales because of the long and slender body of the sea snake. So not only can we learn from nature in order to achieve mobility for our robots, but the robotics research can also help us understand nature. So our analysis of the mathematical model tells us that in water, undulations will make our snake robots move forward, as Mamba demonstrates here. We can have different kinds of undulations, and to the left, we see lateral undulations where the amplitude of the undulation is the same along the whole body, while to the right, we see E-like motion, where the head is kept quite still and the amplitude of the undulation increases toward the tail. So knowing then how to make our snake robots move forward, the next research question was how to make them move forward as fast as we would like. So how would, for instance, the choice of amplitude affect the speed of which the snake robot moves forward? Would increasing the amplitude make the robot move faster since it pushes away more water? Or would it make the robot move slower as it has to move a longer distance from side to side in order to move forward? And again, analysis of the mathematical model provides the answer. It says that increasing the amplitude will make the robot move faster. In fact, doubling the amplitude not only doubles the forward speed, but the speed actually becomes four times as fast. And the experiments performed here confirm this. So having understood how to make the snake robot move forward and with the speed that we want, our next research question was, how do we not only make the robot move forward, but go exactly where we want it to go? In other words, how do we make the snake robot follow a desired path? And to achieve this, we use something called line of sight. This is actually what most of you probably do when riding a bike or a car or any other vehicle where we do not have the opportunity to turn on any force in the sideways direction. We can only steer the heading and the forward speed. And what we intuitively do then is that we look towards the path that we want to follow. And we head the bike or the car such that it's oriented towards a point that lies a certain distance ahead of us along this path. This distance is called the look ahead distance and is shown in yellow here. As we approach the path, this point, since it's always a constant distance ahead of us, it will also move forward and heading towards this point will give a smooth and steady approach towards the path. Our mathematical model also tells us that this look ahead distance, it needs to be chosen sufficiently large or else the system becomes unstable. And you may already have observed this from inexperienced bikers or drivers who look just ahead of the bike or the car, something which results in a sort of wobbly, unstable behavior, while a good driver looks far ahead, meaning that the driver has a long look ahead distance. In this experiment, we have told Mamba to follow the yellow path. And we here see how Mamba uses an undulatory motion to move forward. And it keeps a sufficiently large look ahead distance so that it moves smoothly towards the yellow path. 
An additional challenge that the snake robot faces when moving in water is the ocean current. And in this experiment, there was a current in the direction shown by the green arrows, pushing Mamba away from the path. And Mamba does not know which direction the current comes from or how strong it is. It only has the position measurements. So to cope with the currents, we use what we have called an integral line of sight algorithm. And this notices that something is pushing the robot away from the desired path, and the algorithm automatically adapts the swimming motion to compensate for this. And we can see that the robot follows the path. Learning from nature, we have found a robot which moves efficiently through water with a slender and flexible body, which makes it easy to access narrow spaces, like for instance, between rocks, under ice, or inside shipwrecks. Mamba cannot stand still in water, however. It cannot hover. If it stops undulating, the ocean currents will make it drift away. And that led to our next research question, which was, why not combine the best from biology and nature with the best from technology? So combining the slender and flexible body of snakes with thrust stuff, giving the robot the ability to hover, for instance, to inspect something or to pick something up. And we here see the resulting robot. Specifically, this new marine robot combines several features of existing marine robots into one tube. It has good hydrodynamic properties. It can go straight as a torpedo and turn by curving its body. So it's well suited for long range operations. It has better access capabilities than even the smallest observation ROVs due to its small diameter and its slender and flexible body, which makes it able to go through narrow openings. And it can perform light intervention operations, turning valves and picking up objects, since the robot in itself is a manipulator arm. So in this way, we have moved from biology through university research. And in order to bring the snake robots out of the laboratories and into practical use, we have established a company called ILU. The name Illum is coined from the two words il, due to its biological inspiration, and illum, which means to shed light on and gain knowledge, which is exactly what we want to do underwater. Until now, subsea inspection and maintenance has relied on underwater vehicles with surface vessel support. Illum changes everything. It's a new type of underwater intervention vehicle. The snake-like body combined with underwater thrusters makes the Illum unique. Flexible and dexterous for complex manipulation. Straight like a torpedo for long-distance cruising. Slender and agile for precision hovering and maneuvering even in strong ocean currents. And operating in confined spaces no other vehicle could reach. Sneaking around obstacles and through narrow openings. Shifting into a U-shaped dual arm configuration to tackle intricate tasks. Because the vehicle is modular, you can change combinations of joints, thrusters and payloads. You can mount different types of equipment, like torque tools, grippers, and various maintenance tools. Cameras along the flexible body give the operator a clear all-round view during inspection and intervention. Best of all, the Illum is engineered to live permanently underwater, where it can safely operate 24-7, regardless of weather conditions. This means less use of costly surface vessels and greener and safer subsea operations. With the intervention AUV of the future, ELU is reshaping underwater operations. So the robot in this video showed uh, the first generation robot from 2016, which could go down to 150 meters. In 2018, we developed the second generation Illum robot, ELI 500, which has a death rating of 500, in addition to several other improvements listed here. 
The Trondheim Fjord, which we use as a test site for the Illum robots, it's not as deep as 500 meters, but in this fjord, we have demonstrated one month of subsea residency at 300 meters. And now the third generation Illum robot has been launched, which is tetherless. And having been able to cut the tether is, of course, a major benefit for subsea operations. Here we see a video of Illum testing the navigation system in the Oslo Fjord near Horten in January this year. The robot performs a mission plan, which is tracing an eight, and the tether we see, it's only to transmit uh, real-time high-resolution video. The navigation is performed using an IMU and the Kongsberg Sunstone system. And here we also see the robot diving down, locating and inspecting a torpedo. So the robot, it can move under and inside ice because of its slender and flexible body. And it can take samples since it can hover in water and use the tools at its end to interact with the environment. The robot can also support aquaculture by inspecting the well-being of the fish and also the state of the nets, detecting and repairing holes to prevent fish from escaping, which is a major issue within aquaculture. We have several man-made structures in our oceans, and it is very important that these are inspected, maintained, and repaired to pose as little disturbance to the ocean ecosystem as possible. And uh, as was said in the video, the Illum robot is designed to live permanently at the seafloor, where it can safely operate 24-7 regardless of weather conditions. And since the robot is available at all time, any problems that should arise can be detected and repaired much earlier than today. So the resident robot gives both greener and safer subsea operations. And one of the actors who are dedicated to this is Equinor, which is the Norwegian oil and gas company. And the Illum robots, they are now getting ready to move out to Equinor's Oscar field, where they will work as subsea janitors. And I will end this presentation by showing a short video that Equinor has made, illustrating how the Illum robot will work at the Oscar field to achieve greener and safer subsea operations. So this new bio-inspired marine robot is a useful tool for exploring the remaining 95% of our oceans. If you are interested in more details about this research, you may have a look at this review paper, which includes results on both terrestrial and swimming robots, or the Snake Robots book, which focuses on terrestrial robots. And finally, I want to acknowledge all the past and present members of the Snake Robotics Research Group at NTNU and also thank all co-authors from other groups for the great cooperation. Thank you and thank you all for your attention. Thanks for the wonderful talk. Now the floor is open for Q&A session. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you for the presentation. So um, regarding the uh, time, when, when their applications need actually uh, speed, you mentioned that you can, um, when you double the amplitude, you quadruple uh, the speed. Uh, and for ground applications, like for a fighter, a firefighters, 
uh, what if you can't actually double the speed? In, in the ground, you can actually, uh, I mean, underwater, you can use the thr thrusters for propulsion, but there you might actually not have enough space to go wide anyway. Thank you. Yeah, very good question. Uh, that is one of the reasons why I love the snake robots in water, because they can move freely in three dimensions. While uh, the terrestrial robots, everything is hybrid, and you may have uh, have uh, things in its way that uh, obstructs its uh, its uh, propulsion. But but the same result holds there, uh, exactly as for, for the underwater snakes, that uh, the... Uh, the relationship between the amplitude and the forward velocity is uh, is uh, the amplitude squared. Well, we see that you can also affect the forward velocity by using the frequency of the oscillations. And then there is a direct linear relationship between the frequency of the undulation and the forward velocity. And also the phase shift between the different joints. I didn't have time to get into that here, but the mathematical model in analyzing this, it shows that it's required to have a phase shift between the motion of each joint in order for the robot to be controllable. And also by choosing the right phase shift, we can make the snake robot move forward. So we have three different parameters to tune. And we also have results because going faster is one thing, but you also want to use as little power as possible. So we have also done multi-objective uh, optimization with both speed and power. And it was very interesting to see how just reducing the, the forward velocity a little bit, you could, uh, reduce the energy consumption by more than a half. So, so it's, uh, it's a very fascinating structure to, to analyze, I think. Mm. Thank you. Hi. Um, you said that the um, robot is meant to live under the water permanently. Um, how do you deal with like biofouling and things like that? Because um, a lot of times when stuff is under the water, it gets corrupted by that. Yeah, very good question. Uh, where it's at the Oscar field, it's so deep that there isn't a lot of, uh, of uh, biofouling. But there was also in the docking station the possibility to use uh, ultrasound to, uh, to clean the, the robot. Mm. Uh, thank you for the talk. Very cool. Um, you know, as somebody who works with robotics and such, uh, you know, and really looks at the system. Uh, I, I was seeing a lot of really cool things and also a lot of questions about how you solve different problems. Um, and I'm sure in each robot, you probably had different, you know, problems that you were solving and iterating on. And that's uh, cool to see the different progress that you made. Um, so I had kind of two questions. First of all, is kind of a, a simple technical question. Um, and that is basically, how do you keep the orientation of the robot? Uh, basically the up and down. Did you just, you know, weight the bottom of it or... Did you do something with your control algorithms to basically be able to kind of orient it properly? Because, I mean, obviously with a relatively, you know, radially symmetric robot, you know, there could be some questions about how do you actually get it to move in the direction you want if yes. you don't somehow make it not symmetric. I can answer that before before the second question. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So uh, um, in the first uh, robot uh, prototype, we had uh, ballasting at the bottom to keep this orientation. But then we found that we, we would rather have the possibility to move freely in all degrees of freedom without having one dedicated bottom of the snake. So we don't have that in the, the Ely 500 mm -hmm. uh, um, a version. Um, so, but we have a very efficient road stabilization using the thrusters. Great. Mm. Okay, that that actually kind of leads into the second question, which is like when I saw the animations, at least it seems like you've moved mostly away from the kind of like snake-like wave movement uh, towards mostly using the thrusters for your locomotion, with the the, the snake-like movement mostly just for you know turning and kind of orienting or performing tasks. Is that the case, or was that just how the animation showed it? And if so, why? Um, it's a little little bit of both. Um, when it comes to moving fast, uh, the thrusters are better. So, uh, um, so for the applications that we saw here, uh, thrusters will typically be used for the propulsion, and the joints will be used to have the flexibility of, of motion, uh, being really really agile. 
uh, and uh, yeah. Uh, but for other applications, for instance, uh, um, well, you can think of a lot of applications where it's important to be quiet, and and also uh, you don't want to use the thrusters if you are, for instance, going in between uh, seaweed, and you don't want to uh, to get that entangled in the propellers. So then you can use this undulatory motion instead, and also it's it's very energy efficient going like like this. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much.